Hallelujah. Welcome to worship here this morning at the Salvation Army Ingle Farm. I hope and pray that you are ready to hear from God this morning if you haven't already. Um, I know that he has great things in store for us. And so, we want to give him thanks and praise for who he is and what he means to us. And we wish to acknowledge him as creator and governor of our universe. And we wish to also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we gather here today, the Ghana people, and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging, and remind ourselves that the Salvation Army and we as members and friends of the Salvation Army are committed to reconciliation at every possible opportunity. I wanted to share some words from Psalm 100 as our call to worship for this morning. It's entitled, A Psalm for Giving Grateful Praise. And it says these words, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Amen? Amen. I love the fact that you can join in with some of those familiar words because they are a recurring theme in our psalms, aren't they? Wonderful. All right, earlier the band introduced the tune to which we're going to sing our first song today. It's listed in the devotion section of our songbook, but I've asked specifically that we sing it at a bit, bit more of a brisker pr- a pace this morning because we're using it to o- open our worship. And the words say, Dear Lord, I do surrender myself, my all to thee, my time, my store, my talents, so long withheld by me. I've heard the call for workers, the world's great need I see. Oh, send me to the rescue. I'm here, my Lord, send me. So I'm going to invite you to stand as we sing the first two verses with the help of the band. Thank you. you realise these are kind of brave words to be singing, aren't they? We're actually saying, okay, use me, Lord, with whatever I've got, I'm happy to help. 
Yes? Now, I would like you to be true to what you're singing. I would like you to not sing it, you know, just blasé. If this is your heart's desire, you want to commit to say, yes, Lord, however you may need me to be used, I'm happy to pitch in and help. Because God's not going to ask you to do something that is completely out of your capacity. Is he? Oh, that didn't sound very confident at all. (laughs) He might ask you to do something outside of your comfort zone, but not out of your capacity. Agreed? And he will give you what you need. If he's asking you to do something, he will not expect you to do it without supplying what you need. Okay, we're going to sing the third verse. You're singing gustily. I don't even know what the word is going to say. Bustrous, bust, oh, stop. Stop speaking, Belinda, and let somebody else read the words for verse 3. Amen. Thank you, Margaret, for singing, uh, for singing that, for saying that. We're going to share in these last words of this verse together. And remember, as we're singing these words, that we're singing them from our heart with conviction and obedience. Thank you, band. Thank you. Please be seated. And now I'm going to hand over to Greg and hopefully find my words to catch up with my brain at some point. And we're going to share in the good news. Good morning, Eagle Farm. Hey, here we are on a beautiful winter's day. Well, next Saturday... It's a movie matinee for the ladies. It's a fundraiser here at um, the 24th of June, next Saturday, 3 p.m. On the Sunday, next Sunday, is Messy Church, Fruit of the Spirit, 4 p.m. the Arvo. That should be amazing. Prayer spot, special attention to the prayer spot there, is a man called David Rawlings. It's Major Belinda's cousin, so he needs special prayers this week. Okay, we're still in June, as you all realise, so still soup is the condiment for this month, so soup donations will be placed in the red bin in the foyer there today or in the weekdays. Polo tops, I know we all know what they are, but here at Ingle Farm, the paid staff have a black polo top with white piping on it. Well, it's available for everyone now for a measly price of $32.00. You can have a black polo with white piping and a nice little red shield on the front. So, see Kathy Jackson after the meeting or naturally throughout the week if you'd like to purchase an Ingle Farm Salvation Army black polo top. Craft Group have been renamed. They're now named Wonderfully Made. It's a very nice title, Wonderfully Made. So they are ladies' craft and chat group. Obviously, it's a chat group, a bunch of ladies in a room. All they do is chat all day long. So it goes without saying. Should be an amazing time on the Thursday. Still the same time slot on Thursday. Wonderfully made. You probably all think Greg's forgotten something, but no. Today's the day, people. Hope you all brought your $5 for the soup or pie floaters today. 
If you haven't got money, that's okay. We have FPOS, digital means. So you just go tap and go, you know. All right, it's going to be amazing. I look forward to having lunch with all of you today. Enjoy your day, people. Bless you all. Thanks, Greg. All right, so we're going to participate still in morning tea after church and then that gives us a chance for for lunch to happen. So everyone's welcome to stay and welcome to stay and have some lunch together. It's going to be yummy. Um, I just wanted to expand. Uh, My cousin David has uh, just been diagnosed with prostate cancer, an aggressive form. He is younger than I am. And so um, he's had some tests this week and they get their results on Monday at 5 p.m. So if you can particularly pay, pray for David and his family, his lovely wife Nikki, and they have three daughters, um, just as they come to terms with what the, uh, the treatment's going to be moving forward, they are, have a very strong faith and I've told them that my core is praying for them and they're very appreciative of that. Um, and so we'll know more after this coming week. So I just wanted to let you know about that context this morning. Um, We are going to continue in our worship now as we give of our tithes and offerings. What a blessing that was to all of us this morning. Let's pray. Dear Father, we just thank you, Lord, for the gifts and the talents that are in this room, that you've blessed us each, Lord, to be a blessing, and, Lord, that you'd show each of us what it is that you would have us do to glorify your name and to draw others into your kingdom. Father, I pray that you'd bless this money that's been given this morning, that, Lord, that you would use it so that others may come to know you, for those who come in during the week looking for a helping hand. 
I pray, Lord, that you'll, that you'll triple this money, Lord, and that the effect would be wide-ranging. Father, I pray for Belinda and for Peter, Lord, that you'd bless them as, we, as they lead this meeting this morning. And we do pray for Belinda's cousin, Dave, Lord, who's suffering. And we pray, Lord, for prevention, treatment and cures for pancreatic cancer and that you'll bless the family. So, Lord, accept our prayers, accept our money, accept our talents and our time. For I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, sharing with the children this morning. So if there are any young ones in the house, please come and join me in my bowl of fruit. Amelia and Maddie, come sit with me up here. Come, come, come closer. Come closer. <laughs> closer. A little closer. Oh, she's not coming any closer. All right. How is everyone this morning? Are you good? Are you good? Are you good? I'm great. I'm great. Last weekend, myself and Madison and Pete, sorry, Rhys, um, got to spend the weekend at a farm. And this farm is in a place called Merino. Have you ever been to Merino? It's just across the Victorian border in the middle of nowhere, literally in the middle of nowhere, and we, got to, we get to stay at a farm there, which is also in the middle of nowhere. You drive down the highway, you get to a place called Keith, and then you turn right, and then you keep going to another place where there's caves. What's that place? Yeah, that's the one. All right, we go to Narracourt, and then you go left, and you drive down a road till you get to the place where it's the home of the Kelpies. What's that? Casterton. You go to Casterton and you just keep going a little bit further. Next town's Merino. All right. Everyone coming next time. Now you know how to get there. Excellent. All right. What's interesting whenever we go to the farm, and we've been there a few times at different times of the year, is that things change and every trip looks different. What do you think we might notice differences in as we drive down? What do you think, Amelia? Like when you go on trips and look out the window, what sort of things do you notice? Leaves, because of seasons. Yes, absolutely. Oh, you're going to see, you take a jumper. Yeah. Um, the seasons change things. What that trip does, when you turn off right at Keith, I know places, when you turn right at Keith, you go through um, like lots of vineyards. Maddie, you've seen that, and it's really quite a spectacular. Don't look at them too long, you get car sick, just so you know. Anyway... Part of the year we go, it is green and it's full of grapes and there's often workers in the fields and it's really quite beautiful. This time we went, Maddie, was there any green? No. I'm pretty sure all the vines were dead because they were just sticks, right? That was changed. The other thing that I notice when we drive is sheep because sometimes they're fluffy sheep. Sometimes they're shorn sheep. Sometimes it's a really little baby sheep that I keep saying to Pete, we should stop and get one. He doesn't agree. <laughs> this time we went, there were baby sheep, but they weren't really newborns, but they were still whiter than their mothers. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah right. Good. You're all with me. Excellent. I am getting somewhere, I promise. Anyway, when we got to the farm, similar things happen. In the middle of this farm where we stay, what's in the middle of the farm, Maddie? There's a house. What's behind the house? In front of the shearing shed, the bit in the middle. There's an orchard that grows in grass. And there's fruit trees all through there, isn't there? Sometimes when we go to the farm, the fruit trees are full of leaves. There's a tyre swing. It's be really quite beautiful. This time we went, were the fruit trees beautiful? What were they? Dead. They looked dead. They were just sticks, right? But on the first night there, we had this amazing meal. There was 20 of us there. And uh, after dinner, someone brought out a homemade apple pie. Ah, I know. <laughs> Made with apples from the orchard in the backyard. Could you get better than that? No, no. And it was amazing. 
Anyway, I walked into the, the, into the orchard the next morning and I noticed that there was one tree that had a few fruit left and the fruit looked pretty, pretty not great. And what do you think was on the floor under that tree? Can you think? Do you remember? Rotten apples. And I said to the people that own the farm, oh, what's wrong with these ones? And she said, it was the one tree we didn't get to. We ran out of buckets. They had so many fruit. And I, went, and I got a little sad. I got sad for the apples. Because I thought to myself, these apples never got to find out their true potential. They grew. They hung out on the tree. They got old. They fell out of the tree. <laughs> And that was the end. But nothing else. But the other apples, they got picked and made into pie. And they were good. It was delicious. Anyway, that's exactly where I'm going. I brought this really cool bowl of fruit with me because this is really good fruit. This is fruit that is going to get realised. This fruit was grown for a purpose. It was grown so that it might get picked and it might get what? Eaten. Do you like grapes? Yeah. Do you like apples? Yeah. Do you like mandarin? Yeah. What's your favourite? Grapes. Who here likes apples? Mandarins? Grapes? Not enough for all of you, but that's okay. <laughs> this fruit is kind of like us. We can get born... But the, the reality is each and every one of us on this whole world have a God-given purpose. God has created us to be just the way we are. An orange, a grape, an apple, funky mushroom, whatever it might be. We've been grown for a purpose. And knowing God and loving God gives us hope and joy and a reason for being. But there are lots of people still today that are like those other apples that haven't discovered their God-given purpose. They still grow, they still exist, they still be, they actually look quite beautiful and often provide an amazing function. But do they know their full God-given potential if they don't yet know God? God is asking us, all of us, to be fruit pickers, to actually see people and actually let them know that they have a purpose. They have a potential. They have the ability to be a crisp apple, to be eaten and taken to school. They have the ability to be turned into a beautiful apple pie. But knowing God is part of reaching your full God-given potential. And you guys are fruit pickers as well. And that might look something different for you. It might look like turning away when there's a fight at school and not being a part of that. It might be befriending someone who is being left out or bullied at school. It might be smiling at someone when they look down and sad. It might be saying to someone, I go to church on Sundays and it would be really cool if you came with me because I want you to know about God because I want you to know your full fruit potential. So that's what I want you to think about. I have a couple of different grapes here. I have this one, which is fresh and lovely. This one's looking a bit daggier, right? And there's a rotten one right at the bottom. The last thing we want for anyone that we know or love is for them to die without knowing how much they are loved by God and what potential they have. So there's a challenge for you and a challenge for me and I think a challenge for all of us to see people and to help share God's love with them. Does that make sense? Do you think we can do that together? I think we can. Do you think you deserve a chocolate? Yes, you do. Calm down, I don't have any for any of you either. All right, what have you got? Fredo Frog? I went all out. And you can have a caramel koala. Look at that, one of each. And look at that, two left for me. Woohoo! All right. Have a good morning. Thanks, Erica, for that. 
I'm just um, wondering how many of you are now trying to work out when you're going to fall out of the tree and die. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought the giggle was going on behind me. Yes. No, that's not the takeaway we're going for. Thanks, Wayne. That's right. We're talking about reaching potential. <laughs> so, um, we are going to sing a song and I thought it would be really cool if I did just a couple of question interviews with a few people. Now, the people that I'm going to interview don't know that they're going to be interviewed and I don't know who they're going to be yet because God hasn't told me and that's all good. But I have three questions that I want to uh, have answered. Okay, one is... How long have you been coming to church? Now, it may not necessarily be this church, and that's okay, but how long have you been coming to church? What brought you to this church? And what keeps you coming back? Okay, so they're the three questions. Not terribly difficult, are they? This way for no? Excellent. And there's going to be an extra challenge because I thought it would be cool for our online community to be able to see who I'm talking to. So I'm going to come to you unless you're brave enough to come and stand on the steps, and that's okay. And, and Tim's going to uh, bring the show... No. My words have just gone, flown out the window, haven't they, today? Tim's going to zoom in on us well, on the camera so people online can see who I'm talking to. Okay? Now, none of your faces go, well, this is an exciting prospect. All of your faces are going, she is nuts. Too bad, so sad, we're doing it anyway. All right, so. <laughs> Thanks, Grant. All right, first verse says, I would be thy holy temple, sacred and indwelt by thee. Nought then could stain my commission, tis your divine charge to me. Take thou my life, Lord, in deep submission, I pray, my all to thee dedicating, accept my offering today. There's a line in there that says, Nought then could stain my commission. Now that sounds a bit... Odd, doesn't it? What does that even mean? But it's talking about we're saying we want to be God's holy temple. And if we're sacred and dwelt by him, then that next line means nothing will change that. Nothing will make us um, unworthy. Got it? So instead of just singing words and not having a clue, that's what it means. All right? So Daniel's going to play on the piano for us. And that'll be lovely. We're going to sing. We're going to sing the first verse and chorus. And I'm going to be looking for people in this section who are either going to put their hand up for me to ask the three questions of or who I'm going to nominate if no hands go up. All right? Excellent. Okay, let's give it a go. How bad could it be? All right, Rosalie, now you need to stand up, you need to turn around so that Tim's camera can see you. There we go. So, how long have you been coming to church? I've been coming to... Yellow, there we go. I've been coming to this church for nearly 41 years, but I started at Sunday school as a little girl at the Manham Baptist Sunday School. Okay, so what brought you to this church? Well, I lost my husband... And we lived in Streaky Bay and he passed away. It's nearly 43 years ago. And I came back to Adelaide and a friend invited me to come here. Oh, OK. And I remember her words. She said they play beautiful music while they're praying. And um, so that was a long time ago. Awesome. So what, what keeps you coming back? The fellowship and the friendship with people. Home League, Companion Club, bus trips, 
and church worship on a Sunday. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Grant's got his hand up over here. Give Rosalie a hand for being brave. All right. So I'm not sure if we can get the camera over here. I've been having a little since 1980. Since 1980. Wow. And what brought you to this church? Um, uh, having a good time. Yeah, that keeps you coming back, having a good time. Sing, sing, everyone. I know very good to know everyone very, very well. I was only a little boy yeah. when I came to this church. Awesome. So you know lots of, yeah, when you started coming, you're only a little boy and you like coming and seeing everybody that you know. And we like having you here, don't we? Yes, there we go. Awesome. All right. Who haven't I heard from for a while? Let's see. Raylene. Now, I need you to stand up. Oh, come on, you can stand up. I know you can. And I need you to turn around so that Tim can see us on the camera over there. There we go. Smile. Oh, God. <laughs> now, how long have you been coming to church here? Uh, since it's been built. Since it's been built here. Oh, awesome. So that's about 40 years now. 40... Okay. Well, about four, 43 is about 40. Goodness me. Um, and, and what brought you to the church here? Living nearby. <laughs> living, living close by. Awesome. And why do you keep coming back, Raylene? Well, why not? Why not? There we go. Nothing better to do. Is that right? <laughs> oh, no. There's no. other things. <laughs> do you have some friends here? Oh, I think there might be some. Yeah, there we go. Awesome. Thank you for sharing. All right. Well done. Okay. So this side is going to be next after we sing the second verse and chorus. Thank you, Daniel. Volunteer on this side? No. I'm not this side yet. You're next first, Robert, and I already had you in mind, so you're okay. Mari Collins. <laughs> My love, stand up. Turn around. Smile. There we go. There's a the microphone. How long have you been coming to church? Well, I first uh, came to church uh, back in 1957 uh, to Heinrich, um, and um, and my my husband actually um, introduced me to uh, to the church. Um, but I've I've been here uh, since the, it uh, opened. But, um, about forty years about, ago. About forty years yeah, ago. Yeah, about forty years ago. <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. Ma'am. And, and um, so why did you choose to come here? What brought you to this space? Well, we, uh, we actually did... Uh, we were living at High Marsh and then we went to Canberra and then came back and we didn't go back to High Marsh Corps but we came to Prospect and um, uh, we, were, we actually were staying with... Uh, when we came over, we were staying with um, Gwen and Don Haynes who were very, very... Helpful to us, helping us um, to get located, and um, so. Um, uh, so it was yeah. through their relationship with them as well that brought you to the call. A big pun. It was through your relationship with Don and Gwen. Yes, Excellent. yeah, they've been great friends with us. Excellent, yeah, and so, still are. <laughs> so, yeah. what keeps you coming back? I I just love the um, with the same as what Rosalie was saying with regard to fellowship and um, with. Um, um, with Home League and Companion Club, and yes, I've got a lot, I've got a lot of friends here, and awesome. I, I really love it. 
Thank awesome. you. Awesome. Thanks, Mari. Okay. Although I think I'm not a friend anymore that I came and picked on you, am I? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right, I need one more person from the back here. Let's have a look. Uh, everyone's looking away, looking away, looking away. My friend Doug. My friend Doug. Yeah, there we go. Can we see? It? There's Tim over there. All right. How long have you been coming to church here? Uh, eight years. Eight years? Eight years. And what brought you to church here? Which way? We need to come this way. We're right in the middle of the pole. There we go. Is that better? Excellent. So what brought you to church here? Uh, probably the, the, where I'm located is up the road here, so I thought it would be very quite close. Yep. And the people here. Yeah. And, and what keeps you coming back? The people here. The people? Yeah. The warmth of people here. Excellent. Thank yeah. you for sharing, Doug. I appreciate that. Thank Give you. him a round of applause. Well done. <laughs> All right. Up verse 3 to sing. And then I'm coming to this side. All right. So where's the verse 3? That's the chorus. There we go. Time, helmet, time health and talents. Thanks, Daniel. Robert had already volunteered, but I had him in mind anyway. So, Robert, please stand up so the camera can see you. Thank you. Now, how long have you been coming to church? Uh, about 50 years. Yeah, but not this church for 50 no, years. No, so, yeah. how long have you been coming to this church? Mm, that's a good question. No, five. five years. About five yeah. years, yeah. yeah. And what brought you to this particular congregation? Well, somewhere along the line, we borrowed a book, or Heather did, and we were getting a bit guilty we hadn't returned it. So, we brought it back. And we thought, wow, this is a really fantastic church. And we'd been praying because the church we'd been going to was just a little bit too long, too far away. And we thought, we're finding it difficult to be a part of the church life. So we came here. People like Greg and Lynn made us welcome. But there was a whole lot of other people that were really great, friendly people. We loved the, the service. We loved the band. And we loved the coffee. <laughs> awesome. So they're the things as well that keep you coming back. Is that right? Yes, yeah. yeah Excellent. Awesome. Well, you've answered my questions. Well done. Thank you. I wanted to say a bit more. Oh, okay. You didn't ask me another question. Oh. Why did I become a Christian? Okay. Well, that wasn't on my list. Oh, it wasn't on your list. Okay, but I'd like to tell you that one anyway. I went out to a teacher's college dance. It was a fantastic night. When I came home, I couldn't sleep. So I switched on the TV and I saw Billy Graham. And I thought, I am convicted. I need to become a Christian. That's why I became a Christian, for Billy Graham, and I heard Billy Graham on TV. Mm -hmm. So that's the best part of the story. Awesome. Thank you for sharing, Robert. Give him a round of applause. Excellent. All right, all right. Come on, who else? Who else? Yvonne, lovely. There you go. Turn, or turn around and look that way. There we go. Okay. Now, how long have you been coming to church? Um... I started coming to the Salvation Army as about an 11-day-old baby with my mum and dad. And then this church, I think it's about 15 years. Okay. And what brought you to this church? Um, well, the church we used to go to didn't have very many boys David's age. So we came and there was a lot of youth here. So we came here to have more um, teenagers his age. Okay, awesome. So what yeah. keeps you coming back? Um, I think all the friendship of the church and, and the fact that um, people are very caring when people are going through difficulties and lots of people pray for them. And awesome. Yeah. Oh, well, thank you for sharing. Well done. And thank you for volunteering. That's amazing. <laughs> all right. Now, I can't leave out the band, can I? We've got one more verse and then it'll be the band's turn. So, is this the last verse? Oh, for a heart of compassion. Move, so be compassionate to me, gentlemen and Meredith, um, as we sing this last verse and chorus. Thank you.
and they'll all be very intently looking at their music. David, lovely. I was thinking of picking on you, so I'm really pleased you put your hand up. Now, how long have you been coming to church here? Uh, 15 years. Excellent. And, and we just heard from your mum what brought you is the fact that you could find some friends here. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. And why do you keep coming back here to church? The brass band. You yes. <laughs> yeah. What, why do you like being part of the brass band? Uh, exciting music. Exciting music. Awesome. And do you feel like you're, you're part of the team here? Yep. Excellent. Well, we're really grateful for you to be here. And thank you for being brave for answering my questions. <laughs> Excellent. One more, one more, one more. The bandmaster. <laughs> Pete. There you go. I need you to stand up so that they can see you on the screen. Now, how long have you been coming to church? 35 years. This works when it points to your mouth. 30, 35 years next month. 35 years I've to been this. Here. Oh, wow. That's amazing. And what brought you to this church? My wife and I walked in off the street. Wow. <laughs> we felt um, very uh, welcome. Yep. And um, we've been welcome ever since. That's amazing. And is that what keeps you coming back? Fellowship, music, and um, yeah, lovely congregation and worship of God. Of course. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. Give him a round of applause. Well done. Well, that is amazing. Thank you, everyone, for being so brave. And we hope that our online congregation got to see some of our faces as well as we were doing that. I appreciate it. Thank you, Daniel, for playing. Um, and we're going to be blessed, I'm sure, as the band now contributes by bringing their band message today.
Good morning, everybody. The Bible reading today is taken from Matthew chapter, Matthew chapter 9, uh, from verses 35 to the end of the chapter, and then Matthew chapter 10, verses 1 to 8. It's entitled, it's entitled, The Workers Are Few. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And now from chapter 10, which is entitled, Jesus Sends Out the Twelve. Jesus called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother, Andrew. James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother, John. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Elpheus, and Thaddeus. Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. May God um, add understanding to the reading of his word. Thank you, Yvonne. In just a moment, Peter's going to... um bring the message that God has placed on his heart. But before he does that, we're going to sing together a song um, that we sang a couple of weeks ago, um, which talks about the faithfulness of God. And uh, it's one of those songs that I just have stuck in my head. I wake up in the morning and the chorus is just going over and over in my head and it's a beautiful prayer. And the words of the verse say, Lord, I come before your throne of grace. I find rest in your presence and fullness of joy. In worship and wonder, I behold your face singing, What a faithful God have I. And the chorus just repeats that line, that he's faithful in every way. So we're going to sing, we're able to sing it straight through. Thank you. And we'll be led by the band for this. Um, I'd invite you to stand when we get to verse 3. Okay? Excellent.
Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your faithfulness and we acknowledge you as Lord of our lives and we just want to we just want to rest in your presence. And so now as your servant Peter comes to share the message that you've placed on his heart for our hearts today, may we have ears that are attentive to that and hearts that are receptive to that. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning all, how are we? Ooh, feedback. All right. More feedback. I have done a fair bit over my uh, Salvation Army life, but there's always these guys or people in my life where something just sticks and it always comes to a bit of a uh, comeback to all the time. I used to talk with a guy when I was back in Victoria And I remember one conversation I had with him one week, and I said to him, oh, he said to me, what are you doing? And I said, nothing, just working. And he goes, don't you swear at me. And I stopped for a second and went, no, I didn't say anything bad. Like, no. I said, I didn't swear. He goes, you said that horrible word that starts with W that I don't like. (laughs) What what did I say? He goes, work. All right, fair enough. Terribly sorry. And forever, whenever I met him after that, he goes, you're not doing that swear word stuff again, are you? Every morning I saw him. Work. Who here still works? Who used to work? Yeah, one day, one day I'll be there. No one likes hard work. Who likes hard work? Except my freak of a son over there. And a few others. It's not something where... When someone goes, hey, do you want to come to a farm and rip up floorboards for me in an old shearing shed? You go, yeah, it's a great idea. That's what I did last weekend. That's why I thought about hard work. When we get given a challenge or a task or a job to do, some things go, yeah, I can do that because it fits within your abilities. It fits within your wheelhouse. It fits within your gifts and talents. But when someone says, I want you to do this, and you go, I've never done it before, I don't know what's going on, or want to do this, and I remember doing that, and I'm not doing it again. We kind of shy away from the things of hard work. Which brings us to our scriptures today, which brings us to Matthew. Now, Matthew's scriptures from 10.8 goes on a bit further, but I cut it a bit short because I didn't want to disappear down a, a wrong rabbit hole and not be able to bring you back. But Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, healing every sickness and disease. Where he went, he saw crowds. He had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like a sheep without a shepherd. Now, who here is a sheep farmer? That's what I thought. I did that in one congregation and um, I had some. (laughs) Kind of blew my whole sermon out of the water because they knew exactly what I was talking about and I had to be very, very careful. After that, I went and said, any time you want a hand at the sheep farm, let me know, thinking I'll make sure that's okay. And guess what? They called me on that one and said, can you come and help me uh, drench and um, uh, stripe 120 sheep? Be careful of what you say from the platform. But he goes to say to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. And the workers are few. Who's heard that before? Who's heard that scripture before? Who's heard that in a job? The job is massive. We've got all these to do and we've got two people. And you just go, great, thank you very much. Looking forward to it. But it seems to go a long way of making us feel overwhelmed. Makes us a little bit disconcerting. And it kind of turns people away. When I ask people, it's, what are you doing tomorrow? And you can just see in their head, "Uh uh-oh, lots, I've got so much stuff going on. Or if you go to someone, look, tomorrow I'm doing this and this and this, would you like to come and help? You know, I get more people doing that than if I go, what are you doing tomorrow? You can already see people going, I need to make an excuse straight away. But this was not the case. Jesus was aware that the task at hand was huge. He knew that there was many people out there As every time he spoke and looked up, there was more people gathering in front of him. As he turned around, there was more people following. 
I don't know if you, but I think if you were the 12 disciples walking with Jesus and glanced behind, you would have freaked out a little bit knowing how many people were behind you. And we all know a story about feeding all those people one day. But as he was proclaiming this, as he was talking about what it is to have the good news of the kingdom being here, the good news that the Heavenly Father has blessed all the people that come to know the name, to come and know the Messiah, to come and find Jesus. There was so many. He had compassion for them all. He did not want to leave anyone alone. He did not want to leave his sheep without a shepherd. Can you imagine what that would have been a task for Jesus? Now we know Jesus is the Son of God, but at that time he was the Son of Man. He was sitting on this earth talking to everybody about the kingdom of God. It was a massive task. So he gathered his disciples and said, I've got a job for you. Can you imagine what they were thinking? They would have looked behind at the crowds gathering behind and go, what is going on? He says to them, I'm going to give you authority to drive out evil spirits, to heal disease and sickness and spread the good news of the gospel. Now, if I was going to say that to you guys today, that you guys all have the authority to do that, funny enough, which you do, and this congregation is going to go out and save the entire South Australian people. Who's up? Ready to go? Not many hands raised up there for that one. When we think about that task, we think about what goes on. There is so many people that do not know Jesus Christ, who do not understand what it is to have a fellowship of people, who care about them for every possible need. But he said to the disciples, this is what I need you to do. Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Aphius, and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot. Can you imagine what that would have been like? How many of your people here have a brother or sister in here going, we're going to grab Simon and your brother, Andrew? But I thought, what is it about these 12? Why 12? Well, that's another sermon. We can go on for what it is about numbers in the Bible. But I did a little bit of digging, as I did, a little bit of Googling, a little bit of reading, and I found a little bit of information on each and every one and why they were there. And there was a different reason for each one. Now, Simon, who was called Peter, was the most prominent disciple, a fisherman, but before Pentecost, Peter's mouth created a whole lot of embarrassment. After, it was a tool that was used to unite the early church. But Simon, called Peter, was aggressive and unrefined. He was rough around the edges. He had a capacity for great faith and also great fear. But Jesus still brought him into the inner circle and asked him to do what he needs to do. But unfortunately, tradition says that unfortunately he was crucified upside down in Rome later on in his time. Andrew was the first disciple sent to Jesus from John the Baptist, a man who truly desired truth. When he realised that Jesus was the Messiah, Andrew brought his older brother Simon, also Peter, who would also be a fisherman in Capernaum. Andrew also brought Jesus the boy who had the few loaves and the fishes. He also brought Jesus to the Greeks who were looking for him in the temples. James, the son of Zebedee, another fisherman in Capernaum. Jesus brought James in his inner circle, but instead of being humbled, James seemed to have the pride of being in that space and used it. And at one point it said that his mother actually encouraged him to use that power. But Jesus clearly saw greatness in James. Now John, James's younger brother, was a fisherman partner 
He didn't. He wasn't a fisherman. He just helped those people who fished. So he's the one that fixed the nets, washed the boats, cleaned the fish, mucked out the buckets. Rough job. He wrote of himself as the disciple Jesus loved. Now, who can put your hand up for that one? Are you a disciple that Jesus loved? Do you talk about it? Is that something you hold up for yourself? As part of Jesus' inner circle, John was the only disciple that was present at the crucifixion. Jesus entrusted John for caring for Mary. He outlived all the apostles, apparently, eventually writing both the Gospel of John and the Revelation of John. Traditionally, he was said he would die of old age. Philip was the first man specifically mentioned to be sought out by Jesus to be his disciple. Apparently, he grew up with Andrew and Peter and still lived in his hometown of Bethsaida. But his profession was not mentioned and he quickly found a friend in Nathaniel. That's all we knew about him. Bartholomew was the first man to call Jesus the Son of God. That's it. That's all we know about him, unfortunately. Thomas, our poster child. The one who is remembered for the worst moments of doubting Jesus. We now call him Honest Thomas for believing that what he saw in everybody else, that he should be able to see and know himself. And until he knows that, he won't believe. He was also known to just follow without contradiction and wander along. He was the rational balance to Peter, who was always running around causing mayhem. James, the son of Alphaeus, sometimes called James the Less. I don't know if you want to have that as a title on the end of your name. Hi, this is Belinda and this is Peter the Less. You never know. You never know. Matthew's father was also Alpheus, if you read through the scriptures. And you go, interesting, another brother. To distinguish him from one another, the more famous, James just was there again, following and believing and doing what needed to be done. Thaddeus has only one line in the gospel, and that's all we know about him. John 14, 22. Look it up when you're bored. Simon the Zealot, we know nothing about him except he had zeal. He was the excitable one. He was the one that just was excited the whole time. And Judas Iscario, he was infamous as a thief and a traitor. Although he spent three years with Jesus, he learned very little. As we all know from the stories, Judas took his own life. In remorse. These are 12 individual people, completely different. Few of them were fishermen, one was a tax collector, but we know very little about them except they were different. They were unique. They all had different backgrounds and attitudes. Question is, did Jesus know this when he bumped into them or did he just feel it when they walked around? Or was Jesus building a team that he knew had different skills and different attributes to help in the harvest of life? Jesus was not wanting the disciples to share the same story about who they were and what was going on. Jesus did not want them to walk around in the places where Jesus had been into the temples where people knew Jesus. Jesus wanted the disciples to go where Jesus had not. He wanted the disciples to go to places where they have never heard of Jesus. When you go out today, after church, whatever you get up to, and you go out and someone says, how was your day and what are you doing for the rest of today? What do you say at the checkout, at the fast food outlet, petrol station, wherever you go and go, I'm just going to home, had a busy morning and just going to enjoy the afternoon. Did you go, I went to church this morning and found more about Jesus than I ever knew before. Do you go there and someone says, oh, what do you do over the weekend? Nothing much. 
after work, I just go home and, you know, I've got my weekend stuff. Or do you go home? Look, I go home on Sunday, uh, uh, Saturdays and do some housework thing. And Sundays I go to church and we find out more about Jesus Christ. Do you know about Jesus Christ? Do we do that? Hands up if you do. There's a few. We're not all evangelists. We're not all scripture scholars. We're not all preachers. We're not all pastoral carers or prayers or people who have compassion for others in their times of need. But that's why we're all different. That's why we all have different skills. That's why we cannot go into the field and do it all alone. We need others. This again is a small piece of our Bible. There's verses this morning reading about Jesus continuing and sending people out. Jesus knew that when he sent his disciples out, he was sending them out into a field of wolves. That he was sending them out in a world which may shame them and get rid of them and not listen to them. And if you want to go from uh, verses 10 and on, uh, 8 and onwards in uh, the scripture reading this morning, it talks about that. If you go somewhere and you share Jesus Christ and no one wants to hear that, walk away. Dust your feet off and wander on. Because their harvest is few, uh, is huge. There is so many people out there that need to heal that we do not need to hang in a place where we are not welcomed. The scriptures talk about walking into a house, walking into a town. And if you are welcome, then welcome them with peace and grace. If you are not, then leave and move on. Because there are more towns in Jerusalem than there are days until Jesus returns. Think about that for a size of Jerusalem. There are more towns and places in the world that we need to get to before Jesus comes back. My question is today and with the interviews that we had today, the stories are so very different. Thank you, Blinda, for that. That fitted in so well with today's and what I was looking at. We are so different. We are so unique. We are so special. The question for you today is, are you true to who you are? As we share so many times, it's like, well, I've done all this and I'm tired. I've done, I've retired. I've done my work. I'm too busy to share what goes on. Or I'm too scared of that. Someone might say, go away. I don't want to hear about Jesus from you. Just like the disciples, they have their own skills. They have their own story. They have their own abilities. We cannot do this on our own. As one single person, we cannot go out and save the entire world and spread the good news of Jesus Christ. We need each and every one to do what you can do. And I can't tell you that this is what you need to do. I can't tell you that today you are going to be an evangelist and you are going to be the best preacher in the world and you are going to be the most amazing prayer person who can heal sickness on the spot. I can't do that. That's to you to use your skills and abilities to share the stories, to enjoy life with other people. And when someone asks, what do you do on a Sunday? Or what did you do during the week? Well, I'll share with a bunch of other people who talk about Jesus Christ. Do you know him? And they say, look, I've heard it before, but I'm not interested. No worries. How'd the football go on the weekend? Or if someone goes, do you know about Jesus Christ? Actually, no, I don't. Do you know about love and compassion? No. Share the story. Share what you know. You don't have to be a scholar. You don't have to be the most amazing biblical uh, scripture recaller ever. I can't do that. That's why I have a Bible. But you can share your story. You can share who you are. As a bowl of fruit, you are unique and different. You can share the story. So I haven't got a reflection song for you today. I haven't got a moment where we're going to pause and take a moment. I just have a final song. And a final song we're going to have is In the Army of Jesus We've Taken Our Stand. 
to fight against the forces of sin. To the rescue we go, Satan's power to overthrow, and his captives to Jesus will win. I'll stand for Christ. As people, as Christians, whether it is new or old, five years or 40 plus years, we have the ability to do this amazing conversation with other people. And we don't have to do it alone because Christ gives us everything we knew. We need. We stand for Christ amidst the tempest and the storm, the crazy and the weird. Where Jesus leads, I'll follow on. I'll stand for Christ alone. Let's sing verses 1 and 2. Please stand. Because Jesus pitted our case and he died for our race, to save a lost world he was slain. But he rose and now lives and his pardon he gives unto all who will call his name. Isn't that a great verse? Everybody who can come to know Jesus Christ, who say, you know what, I do want to know more about that Jesus person you talk about, is saved because of Jesus Christ and what he did for us. Let's sing verses 3 and 4. Amen. God be in my head and in my understanding. God in my eyes and in my looking. God be in my mouth and in my speaking. God be in my heart and in my thinking. God be at my end and at my departing. Amen. And God bless you all.